and welcome to our new episode of Aftershock Online. Today I'm very excited to have uh, my good friend Tyler Stone uh, with us. And Tyler's a serial entrepreneur. He's been in business uh, in the real estate world since 2002. He started his own brokerage in 2005. Uh, then he went into the mortgage side um, and does a lot of um, uh, other lending as well throughout the country. Uh, it's pretty impressive what he's been able to do. I'm excited to have you on the show. Thanks for coming, Tyler. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. So, you know, tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, you're from the Seattle area originally. Right. And you moved down here. What, what made you move down here and get into the real estate world? Well, what made us move down here is the weather, 100%. When my wife and I moved down in 2002, neither one of us had a job. We knew one friend in, in Arizona and we had been down to visit for a birthday weekend and uh, had gone back to Seattle. It was early October. Mm -hmm. We had just been in Arizona. Of course, the weather was beautiful. And then we flew back into Seattle. And you're coming down through the, clou the clouds in mm -hmm. Seattle. And the clouds are gray. And the freeway, the tarmac, you know, the runway is gray. And mm -hmm. the terminal buildings at SeaTac Airport is gray. And it was just gray, gray, gray. And I think before we had disembarked off the plane, we decided we were moving. And, and uh, so, yeah, we moved down with no jobs, one friend. And um, that was the start of, uh, that was the start of uh, taking the first step out of corporate and employee type world into entrepreneurialism for, for my wife and I. What were some of the things you learned in those first uh, couple of years? How to be poor. And be poor. It's, it wasn't. It wasn't too much of a lesson, frankly. Uh, both my wife and I are from fairly humble beginnings. And my folks were school teachers as well as hers, and so um, it was uh, one of the first things you, you learn is if you want to raise, you have to make your company perform. Yeah. And so, so that was that was that was first and early, and getting back to working hard and and doing simple things like lead generation back then we would sit down in the sit down in the living room and hand address envelopes mm -hmm. so we get a little higher open rate that kind of thing so it was uh it was the early beginnings of trying to to uh, generate leads and and do good quality lead generation by you know target marketing and increasing a uh, our what would then what was not yet called a click rate um uh, back in those days with hand, address, hand addressing those envelopes. So we'd try to get a 1.5% response rate versus a 1% response rate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Which makes a difference, right? It makes a difference, man. Yeah. Half percent. That can make the, that When you're first starting off, that half percent is, is uh, making your mortgage payment that month or not. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if it's 300 that it's going out, I mean, that's another yeah. 15 people that have responded that's right. to it, right? So, yeah. And those things make a difference. So what, what did your letters say? Do you remember? These were letters that were going out to, we had just started, I had just started in the foreclosure industry, I'm sorry, in the uh, in real estate industry. And the office I worked with my first three years of my real estate career was very uh, foreclosure, real estate foreclosure and investing um, centric. Mm -hmm. So it did, uh, it did wholesale purchasing of properties from foreclosure auction and then uh, worked with investors to uh, fix and flip those properties. Mm -hmm. So the letters we were sending out were to uh, homeowners who had recently had a foreclosure notice filed mm -hmm. in public record. So we would pull those lists and hand address those envelopes to those property owners that were uh, looking at losing their home to foreclosure to see if they wanted us to list it for them or just buy it from them before it went to foreclosure auction. Okay. So it was a targeted, it was a targeted audience and we were, they were also being targeted by other folks like myself. So we thought that hand addressing envelopes and such would, in, would, would increase the response rate versus just uh, labels and such. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, the extra mile and everything always seems to increase, yeah. uh, you know, the return. So you know, fast forward a little bit, then you, you started your own brokerage in 2005. Yes. What, what new lessons were you learning at that point in time? Well, yeah, uh, in the state of Arizona, you have to be a real estate agent with another broker for three years, and then mm -hmm. you can go back and take your real estate broker classes and open your own brokerage or your own real estate company. So in 2005, we started Infinity Wealth Real Estate, and what we learned was that uh, we really enjoyed working with investors, and, and right now we have 20 to 25 agents. Most all of them are involved in, in investment real estate, as well as your retail listing and buying of homes for for first-time home buyers or move up home buyers and such so what we really learned then was that 
that we really gravitated towards the investment real estate. Mm -hmm. And in real estate, you know, when you're involved in buying and selling houses, and even if you're buying your first home, your first home, FHA buyer, first time home buyer, I'm working with a woman now that's using the NACA program. And, and it's just too good of an opportunity to make money mm -hmm. when you're buying a home uh, to, not, to not take advantage of that. And we really focused on um, educating both our real estate agents on how to acquire properties to fix and flip and also our normal residential home buyers and sellers in how to maximize their opportunity in this major, you know, everybody talks about home ownership and buying a home as one of the major lifetime financial transactions. So how to maximize that, fan, that financial transaction and buying a home in terms and maximize it in building your own wealth and incorporating mm -hmm. into your balance, personal balance sheet. Okay, so you kind of take it to that next level with, now, yeah, you're not just buying a home, but here's all the benefits that come from it. Here's how to maximize it and educating them on that. I mean, that seems like an additional service that most real estate agents or brokerages aren't offering their, their buyers. Correct. I, I don't have anything against uh, picking out curtain colors or couches or paint. Mm -hmm. uh, but if a home buyer or somebody out there listening wants help in picking out curtains, they can use a different real estate brokerage other than Infinity Wealth. Mm -hmm. If someone wants to make a lot of money in real estate, mm -hmm. uh, those people need to call me. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a great hand holder. I'm not a great touchy-feely guy. I like curtains. I like paint. Um, but I'm not going to go to Home Depot and help you pick those things out. So extra mile, maybe. Um, I would say that our service level is, is more fin financially oriented okay. rather than uh, retail or... Uh, you know, home decorating, helping you pick out what to put in your house. We're going to get your house and treat it as a financial tool for the rest of your life rather than, uh, rather than talking about where your couch is going to sit in the living room. Fair enough. All right. So uh, then, you know, you fast forward even more and you started your own uh, mortgage company, but Capstone. Tell me all about Capstone because sure. you do several things. So we started Infinity Wealth in 2005. Of course, that was during the run-up of real estate in Arizona. Then 2000, eh, pick your year, 2008, 2009, 2010, during the real estate uh, decline and crash, we uh, got involved in selling bank-owned properties. So mm -hmm. REOs, you know, we did a lot of REO, REO sales in 2009, 2010, 2011. REO stands for, many people don't know this, real estate owned. So it's when the bank has a category of real estate owned. That means, that means the bank is foreclosed on it and they are selling it now. So that's where the acronym REO stands for or came from. So we sold a lot of those properties for banks, Fannie Mae, you know, every, every, pretty much every asset disposition third party company that helped banks sell their properties they foreclosed on throughout that period, 2009 through 2011. When that was winding down a little bit and more of the short sales started to come on the market or when the banks wised up and, and decided to allow homeowners to apply for and be approved for a short sale mm -hmm. or a short payoff in Arizona, that's when I decided to start Capstone Financial. And I thought to myself, well, in this next recovery cycle of real estate, rather than being the hard money borrower, as mm -hmm. I did at Infinity Wealth in 2005, 2006, I borrowed hard money and borrowed money to buy homes and fix and flip them. I thought to myself, well, during this cycle, maybe I will organize and be the hard money lender versus the hard money borrower. Now, I had twin baby boys in 2009, mm -hmm. so that helped make my decision about, about time management mm -hmm. and uh, being a better, uh, trying, well, let's say attempting to be a better husband and a better, <laughs> a better father and try to manage my time by, by not running around on weekends and, and selling houses or managing my fix and flip properties, but, uh, but tried to uh, take a, uh, a more conservative role in, this, in the market recovery by playing a hard money banker and lending money out to people that were, were, uh, were, gonna, were gonna fix and flip properties. It's a less profitable approach mm -hmm. um, to real estate being a lender. When you're a fix and flipper, you make larger chunks of money, mm -hmm. less often maybe, as you complete projects and sell them. Um, but it was the right thing to do in my, uh, in my um, 
life cycle as an entrepreneur and a husband and a father. Awesome. So, you know, let's dive in there. Is I, I, I've been there, right? <laughs> married kids right. and you know you have a, a business running you have you know expenses you have new opportunities coming at you all the time what were some of the things that you learned when you had kids and and what did you do to make sure that you were spending the time you needed to to make sure your family was good well some of the things i learned is how to work from home a little better mm -hmm. um how to manage my days where i would be in the office and figure out which tasks i could get caught up on later in the evenings after we got home and got kids to bed and such. Uh, what kind of things, what kind of things I needed to absolutely get done during business hours during the day versus which administrative tasks I can do in the evenings or early mornings or mm -hmm. clear out emails when you're on the treadmill at 6 a.m. or whatever, or, or send out your end of day. Everybody has a set of end of day type emails that they try to get out mm -hmm. to get ready for the week or the following day and such. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether those go out at 5.30 p.m. or 9.30 p.m. doesn't really matter. Right. You know, it's, it's really meant for the receiving party to be reading those emails as they start their next day or, or, uh, or some, I tell you what, this is a trick I learned. Sometimes I send myself an email because the way I organize my, the way I organize my to-do list, some people have their emails and they have their Google to-do list or whatever it might be on their desktop. Mm -hmm. I just use my email as my to-do list. So uh, sometimes I, a little life hack, I guess, if you want to call that, even though it's super simple, is I just send myself a, a reminder on some item so it populates in my inbox of mm -hmm. my email. So it's sitting there along with my other emails. If it's an action item I need to do, uh, it's sitting there in front of me while I'm taking other my other taking care of my other email action items. That's smart, and, and not having to go out and find another third party tool you're right. in your email right even though it's all in the google suite yeah. i don't have if i have to have two windows open instead of three windows open on my screen i'm i'm 33 percent more efficient yeah <laughs> I, I have a slight problem with my emails not uh all being opened or deleted right. in fact my i uh, had an intern spend six months trying to get me down to zero a year mm. ago and wow. uh i still have about seventeen thousand open so I, I can't do that. But 17,000 that open emails. Or unopened. Unopened emails. Yeah, So and I put filters in and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it all populates the, the stuff I'm supposed to I have to a see. tip for you. Have you heard of starting SaneBox? Over. Yeah, starting over. Get a new email address. Don't give it to anybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of SaneBox? SaneBox, no. All right. I don't own any part of SaneBox. This is a free plug for SaneBox. Sane box, as in staying sane. This was rec recommended to me actually about a year ago, but S A N E box. I think it's five bucks a month, but it's um, it's it is a call it an overlay filter you can use with Gmail or whatever email suite, and it has folders you can train it to send uh, emails from a certain center to sane, to a sane later box. And then at the end of every day, you review everything in your sane mm -hmm. later box or folder. You can email items to yourself if it's in your inbox and it's just cluttering up your inbox, but it is a to, it's a to-do item for you, mm -hmm. but you don't need to do it for three more days. You can send that email to sane box or uh, Tyler Stone or T Stone at sanebox.com or whatever, mm -hmm. or you can send it to September 15th at sanebox.com. It's got a little address you can forward things yeah. to. And then it'll resend that email to you again on September 15th. So mm -hmm. you can get rid of that to-do item out of your inbox mm -hmm. and it'll repopulate a reminder to you on the 15th. So it's got a couple functionalities for that. It's got same black hole where if it's an email from Blockbuster Video, mm -hmm. who's not in business mm -hmm. anymore, It'll send you, you never, just never need to see those, right? So right. You, can, you can send some things to the black hole. You can send some things the same later. Uh, there's, there's some good things like that. Cool. Yeah, I'll check that out. Free, free tip. Free yeah. tip for everybody. Yeah. I, I use Inbox by Google, and that's uh -huh. cool because it just filters everything for me, and then all the other stuff just gets basically dumped. But, uh, right. yeah, um, I'll check that out. So let's talk about the, the marketing side. I mean, being in real estate and mortgage, I mean, that's an extremely competitive space, especially in Arizona. For whatever right. reason... You know, you can't throw a dead cat without hitting a realtor or a lender. Um, how have you been successful? How have you been able to market yourself in, in this area? Well, there's a, there's a couple things that we did. And um, one of the things was focusing on, on what you're good at. Mm -hmm. So for us and what we gravitated to, as I mentioned, was investment real estate. So 
we didn't necessarily start recruiting, but but attracted realtors that wanted to learn about fix and flipping, wanted to be able to teach their clients about fix and flipping, that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. we were a fairly specific type of real estate brokerage in terms of our core strength. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the things that we focused on in terms of marketing was you know, really really talking to people about a core strength and making money in real estate, not with not with intention of having any coaching programs or seminars mm-hmm. or paid curriculum or anything like that, like you see a ton of mm-hmm. on cable TV late night or whatever. Um, just talk just talking to people about if you're going to be in the process of buying real estate, you might as well make the right kind of buy where you can make money. So that was really appreciated by our clients, and, and, and we were referred to a lot of people from our clients because mm-hmm. of that reason. Um, on, on the, in, the, in the Capstone environment, Capstone mm-hmm. Financial, which is our lender, our lender uh, company, we, we really focus on the client channels that we're, that we're trying to attract. And at Capstone, that is investment real estate um, business people mm-hmm. that are that are focusing on fix and flip lending and whatnot. And then, and then we also have a wholesale channel where brokers around the country, um, they see our advertisement in industry, industry sources mm-hmm. and we, uh, and they bring us deals for their clients that have fix and flip or bridge type financial needs. So mm-hmm. that's, that's really how we go about it. Okay, cool. So you, niche down to exactly who you're trying to to target with you know one product and then you spend your energy in marketing that to those people exactly yeah okay. cool um so i know that you're you, always educating yourself and i've known you for quite a while but uh you know what are some of the books that are go-to's for you what are some of the podcast things that you listen to to keep yourself educated but uh help have helped you in business and in life Okay, well, here's where I'm going to put a disclosure out to your listeners. And for everybody that's there, Josh asked me this question ahead of time. So I had a chance to write down a couple book titles and think about it. So I have four here I'm going to talk about on this piece of paper. So one, one, one are a couple of old school standards, and there's a couple new ones in here. So the first one that I got most recently was one called Tribe of Mentors. And this, uh, a CEO coach that, um, that I'm involved with through Vistage International, he gave this to me for Christmas last year. Mm-hmm. And Tribe of Mentors is a bunch of interviews following the same format, probably how you do your shows, yep. with different business owners and, and entrepreneurs and, and notable people throughout the world. Elon Musk uh, would be one uh, that's, that's popping into my head now. Mm-hmm. But it's... It's, Maria Sharapova. I mean, it's Tim Ferriss's podcast. Something like that. Got incredible. Yeah. So there's um, there is uh, a few a few in there that are notable and some I've never heard of before. Mm-hmm. But the same set of questions were asked of all people, and you get to read the interviews, and it's almost a cross between coaching and inspirational quotes mm-hmm. by Ken Blanchard or something, right? You know, whatever mm-hmm. his books are. So these ones. It's you can before you go to bed at night you can read four or five pages and typically get something good out of each person that's interviewed. So that's one tribe of mentors, and then one that came out about ten or twelve years ago is one called uh, Jim Collins wrote it. Good to great. Now some people might argue that the examples of companies that were used in that book are no longer relevant or the criteria that they used it was it was done with some research out of Stanford I believe if I'm remembering correctly about how companies. Uh, had some kind of event in their history, and that event caused a um, a trend where they were outperforming their market segment. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was Caterpillar versus you know the rest of the machine industry or something like that, or Harley Davidson or whatever. Now, I don't think this is a good book because of the companies that were used in there or any of the research or anything like that. I think this is a good book because some of the concepts mm-hmm. in this book uh, were... And some of the metaphors, frankly, are ones I still use in my office today with my staff. Things that relate to building momentum from being a small business owner to building momentum. One of the examples in there is starting a business and feeling like you're stuck dead stop and how difficult it is to generate any momentum. 
And in the book, they talked about a big, giant stone or steel flywheel. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what a flywheel is. Once you get it going, it keeps going, but it's real hard to start. So when you first start a business, you got to push really, really hard on that flywheel to get to move an inch. And then you get to move an inch and you keep pushing. And you get to move two inches and three inches and up to 10 inches. And once you got that thing moving 10 inches, you have your first little bit of inertia. And then to keep that flywheel moving, it's a little easier and a little easier. And you just keep pushing that flywheel, keep pushing that flywheel. As a small business owner, you'll be into month three or month six or year three or year six. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the flywheel's moving. It has good inertia. Your business has good inertia. And you can keep going and making it more profitable, more profitable without as much painful bleeding effort as a small business owner. Because believe me, as a small business owner, week one is painful and bleeding. Week six, still painful, still bleeding. It takes a while. It takes a while to get the flywheel moving. Right. It takes a while to make money. It takes a while to feel comfortable. It takes a while to know that, oh my God, I'm gonna be able to make my mortgage next month and I'm gonna be able to make my mortgage the month after that. Right. <laughs> right. It takes yep. a while. So that's the other one. I tell you what, the third one I want to talk about is an old one called Art of War. Art of War. Maybe you heard of this one. Old book. It's written about how to build an army and win a war. But there's some concepts in Art of War that are easy, easy to, to transcribe into the business world. And that is build your army first before you go to war. Mm -hmm. When you advance your army, make sure your army has provisions. Concepts like that. You don't want to get out over your heels and do a bunch of lead generation, for example, if you don't have the ability to fulfill or do fulfillment on those leads. So make sure you can make sure you can deliver on those leads and deliver product to those sales or deliver service to those clients before you go out there and spend a ton of money to get them. So Art of War has six or seven chapters that address different types or different phases of trying to advance an army and win a war. And they're all extremely applicable, sorry, mm -hmm. to building your business, starting your business, and ending up with continued uh, client and customer um, satisfaction. Awesome. All three are, are fantastic. Good books, books right? Yeah. Uh, are there any podcasts or anything that you'd recommend, or do you listen to podcasts? I don't listen to podcasts. You know, I, it's something I got to start doing. I have uh, I have Spotify and, mm -hmm. and whatnot on, on my phone and, and, lap, and laptop. I, I generally... Um, have some time in the gym to listen to podcasts, but I need to start. I need to start listening. So I am open to suggestions yeah. from from everybody on Facebook uh, at Capstone Financials Facebook page, or or from you, of course. Yeah, no, I you, you dig Tim Ferriss's podcast because he literally wrote that book yeah. by his interviews that he <laughs> right. did in the podcast. So you right. really really enjoy his. Perfect. Um, well, cool. Uh, well, let's get down to the Afshock takeaways. You know, I'm, I'll read them out, and then if you just want to expand on them, your first takeaway was love what you have. Right, right. Um, first takeaway, love what you have. And you know, guys, I'm, I'm in the audience now. I'm 45 years old. I turned 46 in October. I know I don't look it. It's because the TV, they got the lights. I tell you, they adjusted all these lights before we came in here. I look in the monitor up here. I'm like, man, I look 43, <laughs> but I'm 45. Um, I tell you as, you, as you get on through life and you get on through, um, through building your business and that kind of thing, it's really important to just recognize what you do have now. And, and the whole concept of the grass is always greener, Oh, I wish I coulda, shoulda, woulda. Um, those things, they, those are self-doubt types of items that, that get in your head, and and they get in my head still. And um, you know, loving what you have is is uh, is really key. Just having you know self-satisfaction doesn't mean that you have to be satisfied with what with what mm -hmm. you have. It doesn't mean that you're going to lose your fire to go out and build your business more, or be aggressive or assertive in in. Um, and developing yourself both personally and professionally, but loving where you're at now and loving what you have now, that that's a real key type of theme that, frankly, I don't think about enough. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but it's but it's important. Awesome, yeah. I mean, kind of just to expand on that, it makes a lot of sense because if you're constantly unhappy at every goal that you achieve, and right. because now you're striving for the next thing, <laughs> what the hell are you doing it for? Right. You know, you got to enjoy the process. You've got to enjoy your family, you know, the, right. the little wins. I agree. I mean, and I don't think about it near as much. So that's a good reminder. All right. So number two, if you can be small and profitable, be small and profitable. <laughs> right. This is something that a friend of mine told me probably, his name is Morgan Smith. Mm -hmm. Still friends. We're still hunting buddies. 
and he lives up in Portland now, but he was, uh, he had a, a big mortgage company, frankly, with a lot of branches and whatnot, um, sold it right before the crash or before the market uh, really, really got brutal. But um, he probably told me this in 2003, 2004, and I asked him about, hey, you know, you have all these net branches around, the uh, name of his company was Morgan Capital, and he sold his mortgage company with a bunch of net branches and loan officers to a larger mm-hmm. mortgage company that acquired him. And I asked him his advice at one point, and, um, and he said, man, if you can stay small and profitable, do that because it's a lot, a lot less headaches, a lot less liability, and a lot less babysitting. And so that was one thing, one thing that, uh, that I still remember him saying. And, you know, Morgan's not some guy with a PhD. I mean, he's not from Yale. He's, he hasn't written any books. He's just a good, gritty guy with a lot of street smarts and, and, and a good sales guy that's, frankly, he's like us. He's our age. He's got three kids the same age as yeah. our kids, right? Um, now that's 12 years later. But but uh, just a just a good gritty hard working blue collar type of guy that that uh, that planted that seed in my head twelve years ago and I tried to observe it best I can. Sounds like he's living by number yeah. one. Now he's Love living the dream, have, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, awesome. And number three, bank account versus ego. I like this. Right. So my um, my staff and I. We go through, I make them all set five personal goals and five professional goals, mm-hmm. and then we review them together. And we review them in team meetings and we share them with each other. In fact, it's time, it's time, uh, it's time for me to have them reset them because we missed, the, we missed that activity in, Octo- in, in August when we did it the first time. So mm-hmm. we need to do it again so we can go into the end of the year with, the, with our eye on the ball. But some of the goals, and we use the SMART, SMART goals mm-hmm. you know, type of format, yep. specific, measurable, et cetera. So some of my goals, when I read them, I realized that they may not do anything for my bank account. And they may be ego goals with a good ego, and they may be goals with a bad ego. Mm-hmm. And there's, um, I, I want to make a dif- the differentiation, differentiation, differentiation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, different. Differentiator, different, something like that. That's a lot of syllables for a Monday morning. Yeah. Differentiation, is that six syllables? I think that's six syllables. Okay, so let's talk about ego real yeah. quick. I'm There's, still thinking about syllables. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't count them either. Ego, that's two ego, syllables. Ego. Okay, so, so one of the things that we got to think about here, and when we're talking about ego is, okay, yeah. what is ego and why is it bad? Why is it good? Well, let's break it down here into two things. We can talk about big ego, mm-hmm. and everybody can probably correlate the phrase big ego to being having a negative con- 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 connotation. Mm-hmm. Big ego is bad. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about strong ego. Because mm-hmm. if, if you have strong ego, that means you have self-confidence. Self, self uh, mm-hmm. Strong ego means that you're assertive. Strong ego means you can ask for what you want or what you need. Strong, egos, strong ego means you can close a sale, right? You can ask for the order. If you had a weak ego, you have weak confidence, you can't ask for the order, you're not going to build your business very far if you have a weak ego. Mm-hmm. So when I talk about ego, I want everybody to make sure that they understand I'm talking about street, strong ego, not big ego. So when we're talking about ego versus bank account, we're talking about making sure that our goals and our decisions we're making, we're making either because it benefits our bank account mm-hmm. or it's based on our strong ego and not having a big ego, right? Maybe someone wants a big, huge house because the grass is greener on the other side where your neighbor has a big green a bit a bit a bit a big old house Mm -hmm. well that might not be good for your bank account and it's probably not because you have a strong ego it's probably because you have a big ego and Mm -hmm. you're not love going by the rule of love and what you have so maybe it's not the right time for you to buy a big old huge luxury house on Callenback mountain if you're still building your business Mm -hmm. and and uh, you're focused on your strong ego and your bank account versus versus who someone what somebody else has and and having a big ego that's the, that's the gist of it. Got a little convoluted there, but you get the gist. No, totally. Um, you know, and I, I don't know if I just made this up in my head or I heard it somewhere, probably heard it somewhere. I'm not that smart. But nothing great ever happens without ego getting involved. Correct. Without your ego getting involved. I mean, right. You can't meet your fitness goals. You can't meet your business yeah. goals. You can't be a great husband, a great dad. I mean, something about that drives you to where you already see yourself like that, and that driver gets you to those goals. So I, I'm... I'm a big proponent of. Yeah, absolutely. 
Everybody listening, it's okay to have an ego. Just make sure it's a strong ego, yep. not a big ego. Absolutely. You'd be real successful just remember that one theme. Absolutely. I love it. Well, man, this has been great. Thanks for coming on. I know it was a uh, short notice. Yeah, I planned on having you out in a couple months like we right. talked about, um, but I really appreciate you coming in. A lot of great nuggets. I think people will get a lot out of this. So. Perfect. Um, any, right. any asks for our audience before we go? Sure. One thing that we are focusing on Capstone Financial is our Capstone Fund 5. Capstone Fund 5 is our pool of money that investors put their self-directed IRA money in or their investment dollars that are sitting in some mutual fund. And we uh, administer the process of lending money out of Capstone Fund 5 for these fix and flip loans. The interest from the loans goes into the fund and pays our investor. It's almost like buying a CD or a one-year, or 10-year, or five-year CD, but instead of getting a 0.9% yield, we actually are averaging paying our investors between 10.5% and 12% monthly. So if anybody's interested in playing Hard Money Lender with us, um, we'd love to talk to them about capstonefund5.com and uh, how they may be able to participate with us. Awesome. Good stuff. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in. We appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks.